Hello folks, welcome to another update on the situation going on in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey here with you on November 16th. It's about 1 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time. That would make it about 8 o'clock in the evening in Iceland. Hope you're doing well. For those of you in Iceland, uh, we continue to think about you and are concerned about your well-being, your mental state. So please hang in there and we're hoping for the best possible outcome uh, during this stressful situation. Um, today what we'll do is give you some updates on what's been going on in the last 24 hours. Obviously no eruption as of yet. I have some insights into, uh, maybe not insights, but some perspective that might help help you understand why there's such a, a delay or a pause, if you will, why the earth is taking so long to erupt if that's what it's going to do. Um, and we'll also, I think we'll have time left we'll to see to cover some questions. I got a lot of questions from folks from yesterday's update as I requested, um, but I don't think I'll be able to get to them all today. Well, I know I won't be able to. So possibly depending on if tomorrow's a bit of a slow day, uh, we can handle some more of those question and answer type things then. But I will try to get to as many of those as I can. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, also wanted to quickly, for those of you that are new to me and, and what I've been doing um, with my YouTube channel. I'm a geology professor first uh, here at the College of Southern Idaho. Um, I've been teaching for uh, over 20 years. And when COVID happened, I started putting together uh, field-based geology videos as a way to bring field trips and earth processes and landforms to my students. Um, it kind of grew from there. People outside my class and in the general public and in the world of the internet found them and, and found them helpful and valuable and educational, which is great. Um, and I'm all for educating as many people as I can. Of course, it's a learning process for me. I learn from my viewers. I, I learn when I'm going into new places. So in addition to all the Iceland updates, um, just to let people know, so this is a uh, a, a bit of a public service announcement, I suppose, but there are other videos on there. The best way to probably navigate the whole uh, routine here with over 270 videos is probably by playlist. So if you go to playlist, you'll see there's like a, a series I just started called Random Road Cuts. So you can look at a few under that title if you want. And then there's a few that I've done in the classroom, like rock identification, minerals, there's uh, geology in the news, which is what a lot of this Iceland update stuff is fitting under, at least the way I've kind of organized this. There are, and then basically it's geographic locations. So places that I have visited, these are videos that were shot in that location, out in the field, um, and it might be looking at a specific road cut, it might be looking at a landform, processes, uh, whatever. So you can see it's mostly Western U.S. based, some stuff in Hawaii, some stuff in Iceland, and I'm continually trying to add to that. So just so you get a little sense of, of who I am and what I've been up to before, you know, all this other Iceland stuff came about. So you can get on there and, and read through all the things uh, if you'd like to. So um, let's uh, go over a couple things then from our update yesterday. So um, first of all, I want to thank all the people who commented. There were a lot of people who speak German that corrected me, and I appreciate all the corrections um, that you can send me. I'm winging this, as you probably can figure out, and so I'm going to make mistakes, and I will not be perfect. I'm just trying to give the best information, uh, the best and most level perspective uh, that I can, trying to separate the facts, what we know, from any sort of observations or interpretations. So yesterday we talked a little bit about a term that's being used somewhat in the eruptive or possibly eruptive situation here near Grindavik, and that is Graben. Graben is a German word. Uh, if you take a Geology 101 class like I did back in the day, the professor usually tells you that Graben is a term for grave. So it's a downdropped block between two faults and so, you know, like a lot of students, I just nodded my head and the professor said it. And so made sense to me. I didn't know German. Um, so that's not correct. So I'm glad that I know that. So I don't have to propagate that misinformation with my students. Uh, apparently, Graben as a noun means like a trench. Um, so like a, a, a ditch, if you will. And then if it's used as a verb, it means to dig. So Graben does not mean grave. 
and f it, you can see the similarities. Um, but I can and I can see how you know it Grobman being a down dropped block between faults uh, where that word would come in. But good to know that the the translation I was given back in my education, wherever that was, was not the correct one. So I appreciate all the folks who got on there and corrected me. Uh, there was also another correction that was made um, about the wall that's being constructed. And when I said it at the time, I can't even believe I said it because it just sounded silly. Um, but I did hear it on a, a radio program, uh, English speaking radio program from Iceland, roof.is. Um, that the, the wall they're constructing, the, the, the barrier for diverting the, the flow around the power plant, I said 30 meters, which, you know, after I said it, I'm like, that is pretty insane. That would take a long time, a lot of material. Um, what I've heard in, from some people to correct what I said is probably more like three meters, maybe three to five meters is kind of what they're looking towards there with the possibility of heightening it if they need to. And so construction on that wall has already begun. Um, and so this is a view of, there's the, the highway there, and then this is one of the, the topographic hills there. And you can see they're, they're piling up that material. I guess it's going pretty fast. So they've been working more or less around the clock, transporting material in, uh, and then building up this, this berm, if you will, or um, I don't know what we call it, this mound, this wall um, that would help divert some of the lava. Some people said, well, won't the lava melt the rock well the rock they're using you know 95 percent of all the rock in iceland is basalt and basalt is the same is the rock that results from the type of magma or lava that we're dealing with here so this rock is a rock that formed at very high temperatures so if lava were to you know uh run into it or touch it um it would not melt that rock even if it's sitting there for days um, you know, possibly a few weeks or so, it's not going to melt it. And as it touches that rock, because that rock's presumably much cooler, the lava is going to cool it as well, form a thin crust up against it. And because rock and magma, it's a good insulator, uh, the heat, you know, it's not going to have, you know, 13, 1400 degrees Celsius lava up against the rock for a considerable amount of time. So anyway, so the rock will not melt. That's not a consideration. So these are some photos uh, from Brian Emfinger. Appreciate his permission in, in showing these. Um, another view here. So the other thing I didn't know about, but the graphic that I had just showed a, a wall being built on the power plant side, on the west side of the road. And it was obvious to me and probably a lot of people that there was a clear little saddle or valley where previous lava flows had came, come down um, that could also impact the power plant. And so I wondered why, according to the graphic that I had at the time, it, there wasn't a, a wall being built there. Well, lo and behold, the graphic just didn't show it, but you can see here, uh, right there, kind of in the middle ground, they're building that same type of barrier uh, in that area as well. And so they, they're covering all their bases and, and I knew they would. Um, just good to get that confirmation. So just some views there. This is uh, looking, this view is looking more or less southeast. Here's the main road heading down to Grindavik. Um, and yeah, the power plant, this is probably some of the steam from the power plant in the foreground. And you might be able to make out a little bit of the, the structures there, but it's more or less down over here along, and I guess in the lower left corner. Uh, a couple other views that Brian provided. So here's a nice kind of big picture, wide angle view of the whole the whole situation. So the Blue Lagoon located over here on the right power plant where all the steam is coming out. Uh, here's the hill uh, Thorbjorn. If I'm saying that right and I'm probably not trying though. Um, and then there's the, the road running down towards uh, Grindavik. And so what you can see here is that first view I showed you is this little section here. So they're starting the wall here, and presumably this will extend uh, across the road, swing around uh, somewhere through here, around the Blue Lagoon, and then they'll they'll take the end of that little berm or wall and abut it against uh, Thorbjorn, this mountain, this hill that sits over here to the west. The other thing you can see is the, the here's the little pass we were concerned about where lava had come down previously, um, and I think you can see some of that wall being built right there if that's the right view let me go back one and make sure 
uh, yeah I think that's correct so that view there is right there so you can see portions of that wall being built there so given that they've only started on this a few days ago uh, look, looks like they're making great progress and so uh, that's really helpful that's great um, okay so those were just some corrections I wanted to make over yesterday one about the wall uh, how to pronounce the term grobin and such so awesome um, okay so let's now look at some updates on, of what's been going on uh, today so this is the latest from the Icelandic Met office and this is a uh, pretty notable so you can read it as well as I can magmatic gas is measured from a borehole confirms the presence of magma in the earth's crust so basically they drilled an angled uh, hole borehole uh, down into the ground uh, towards from the um, I guess I could pull this up here that might help a little bit from somewhere near the power plant and they drilled it to the east went under the road here and I don't know exactly where that borehole um, ended and they don't really say for sure the depth but basically got that borehole as close as they could to our little crater row here the Sunnukur craters that exist here and what they were able to detect what then even though they weren't drilling and weren't trying to drill into the magma itself they were trying to get close enough to see if they could confirm its presence I mean all the seismic data suggested highly strongly suggested that there was magma in the subsurface all the ground deformation um, but it's always nice to get a little bit of a confirmation and so um, it, if we get down to let's see yeah measure so they they measured sulfur dioxide uh, in a borehole it was drilled diagonally to the east and, and under the road that's the road there and towards uh, the craters uh, the end of the borehole therefore extends close to the place in the earth's crust where the magma is thought to be uh, further measurements will be made tomorrow this is an update as of today at almost six o'clock p.m uh, Iceland time but the fact that magma gas is measured from the borehole is confirmation that magma is present north of Hagafell just as models have indicated so it's nice to have your models of all your indirect data pointing towards one interpretation and now what they've done is they've gone in and got direct data that, that confirms those models so that's just good validation tells us that we're on the right track um, so that's good news in the sense that everything we thought was going on is in fact going on uh, the other thing going on here and we'll get to this in a second and I'll show you these maps here in a minute too with a better view um, so seismic activity pretty constant very similar to the last few days uh, about 1400 earthquakes um, since midnight of the night before largest one was about 2.9 near Hagafell and I'll show you where that is if you're not familiar like I wasn't a few days ago with where is this location because now it's becoming more prevalent in some of the notifications we're getting let's look and see where this location is uh, deformation so the GPS and the ground deformation is all pretty much on track and then uh, so probability of an eruption is still considered high I think that's worth noting um, we haven't decreased our sort of um, you know uh, alert level or uh, diligence in considering that um, maybe signs that the magma is making its way to the surface oh wait so, let me read this uh, completely here signs of shallowing micro seismic activity so earth, tiny earthquakes getting closer to the surface and sudden slippage are being monitored so they're watching for that and if we see that that may be signs that magma is making its way to the surface and right now there are no signs of that so um, right now that's good news if you're hoping for no eruption at all um, is that we're not seeing any signs of that so probably going to be several more days um, and then this is interesting data here and so we've known that the town of Grindavik was um, sinking subsiding the land we've seen the cracks in the ground getting wider the elevations had dropped a little bit but they've got some good uh, hard data here and this graph here nicely shows uh, for this location here this station starting on the 12th of November which was what Sunday so from Sunday till today you can see basically the ground elevation dropping uh, for a total displacement or sinking if you will of about 25 centimeters uh, which is 
pretty notice pretty notable um, about five centimeters per day um, and you know if this trend continues that could be um, that could be interesting or a tough situation um, let's go to the map and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail let's make this a little bit there we go so we can see the full map so this was a nice map that they also put out as well um, the red line here the dotted line is more or less the location of the magma intrusion or what they're calling a magma tunnel uh, you know just a little bit different verbiage than we might use here in the states or other english-speaking countries but we get the gist of what they're saying um, and then the the pink lines with the little teeth on them on either side that's representing what they're calling um, and the direct translation when you translate it from Icelandic to English it's sickle valley so if you start seeing things in some of the Icelandic news reports when you translate to English if it says things like sickle valley um, this is what they're referring to now sickle valley is not a geologic term I'm familiar with I've never heard of it before so it's probably a direct translation thing but essentially what it's showing is the the area that's that's sinking or subsiding the area that's becoming lower uh, in fact I asked uh, Amanda Joe, who's one of the residents in Grindavik who's helping me out with getting information um, and she asked her husband who's a native speaker and he tried to explain it as best he could but he ended up kind of warping his hands down into a bowl like hey it's where the land drops and it looks like this um, and so that's the intent here is this is a down dropped area so the subsidence is important because we have a community here that's on the coast and so if you look at elevations in and around uh Grindavik, and I've, I've switched over to meters here on google earth just just let's stay with meters that's the unit they're using and that makes the most sense and i'm a fan of metric um, but you can see that lots of parts of the town are only a few meters above uh, sea level and so you know you come over to here it's like two meters above sea level come over here it's four uh, over to this area it's like eight and so one big concern here is is if the land continues to subside or sink is the sea level then would encroach into these areas and possibly flood them and again I'm not saying that's what will happen but if the subsidence were to continue that would definitely be uh, a concern the other thing that could be an issue here and I, I don't have the data to to confirm this or know if this is really as much of a worry as it might be is we would also want to know what the water table is doing there because if you if the land sinks um, and the water table the groundwater is at a certain elevation you can end up with areas becoming flooded as well that's probably what's happening here with these these ponds these little small lakes over here is they probably intersect the groundwater the regional water table in that area uh, and so you might see these starting to get bigger over time and I think I might have even heard uh, or seen something like that so much information coming across it's hard to hard to keep track of it all so um, okay so hopefully that's helpful a little bit there and if we then turn to uh, the earthquakes that have been happening so here's quakes over the last 24 hours above magnitude 2 um, and you can see as I zoom in here you know, we got a few down here uh, near Grindavik but here's the area where they're seeing a higher concentration of not just the bigger quakes but if we put all the quakes in there um, you can see there's a lot of quakes happening in that region and this is this area uh, called Hagafell which is just across the road and a little bit south east of the power plant so let me switch back over to here and I actually kind of marked it so I could keep track of it so here's Grindavik um, and the, we have these these two mountains here what what are called Moberg ridges or Tuyas we can get into that later they're old subglacial volcanoes at least this one is I'm not sure about this one uh, this could just be some sort of cinder cone anyway so we've got this higher topographic area but this is the area where we're seeing the greatest concentration at least the last few days uh, in terms of earthquakes and activity so right now if it were to erupt in the very short term uh, if you had to take a stab at where this thing were to erupt this seems like the most likely area is somewhere in here um, so we're not seeing maybe as much evidence that it's going to be a, an ocean 
uh, eruption or something under the town, which would be really bad, but something in this area. It still could be further up the crater row. It could be in a completely different area. There's some, some thoughts that it could end up over in the Eldvorp craters over here, this little string of craters on this side. Um, I don't know what data or what leads to someone to concluding that, but I'll, I'll respect that opinion as, as well as mine and any others. Um, so this is the area we're looking at here. Uh, so if we go back to the seismic data, yeah, if we just take out all these messy earthquakes and just look at the bigger ones, uh, you can see a, a clear clustering over the last 24 hours. If we, if we narrow that down to 12 hours, that reduces a few of the quakes. Still a couple up here, so we're still considering that area uh, possibly at risk as well. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to cover real quick is maybe just a little bit of housekeeping uh, and terminology because you know, I'm a geologist and I, I can get through some of the, the terms pretty well, but I think if you're uh, just an average person out there, um, it can seem a little bit confusing. And so what I've done here is, is something that I hope will clarify some of the terminology that you might be hearing about some of these features. So bear with me on this slide, which is very boring and has a lot of words on it. And then I'm going to show you some photos, which I hope will explain this in a little bit better detail and I rather than coming up with my own definitions I decided to turn to um, the gold standard at least in America and that's whoops let me go back one is uh, the glossary of geology fifth edition American Geologic Institute so a bunch of geologists got together once upon a time probably in a smoky room and decided and agreed upon and debated the exact definition of different geologic terms and if you want to know what that what that looks like uh, here it is in all its glory it's a solid almost 800 pages um, and it's tiny print so yeah all sorts of words there's words in here I've never even heard of all the mineral names there's thousands of mineral names uh, it's a meaty book to, to get through but it has all the terms in it so that's what I where I took these from so a couple terms you're gonna hear or if you haven't already uh, is a dike and the spelling of these can vary a little bit if it's more UK based it might be with a Y uh, more American based it might be with an I um, but unfortunately right now in Iceland we have two uh, two features I suppose that could correctly be called dikes and they're completely different so let's start with the first one here uh, a tabular igneous intrusion that cuts across layering of rock so basically when magma intrudes uh, along some fracture and cuts across whatever pre-existing layers were there so out here in Iceland we've got stacked lava flows that are more or less horizontal and now we bring magma up at some high angle to that maybe vertically that would make if that cools and solidifies that would become then a dike okay uh, at least one type of dike um, another um, another definition though for the word dike is an artificial wall mound or embankment built around a relatively flat low area so essentially i've tried to steer away from this word as to not you know have any confusion but this is what they're building around the power plant they're building uh, a, what we might call a levee or a dike i've called it a mound a wall uh, a berm i don't even know if berm's the right uh, term either but they're building up an artificial structure around the power plant in this instance they're using it to uh, keep the lava from inundating the area in other terms you might use a dike to keep an area from being flooded so you might have dikes or levees along the sides of a river or stream and as the river rises and falls that would help maybe keep that water from inundating some areas so uh, and then we have the term fissure and so there's really sort of two different versions of this word that we're looking at a ground or a tectonic fissure it's a fracture or a crack in the rock along which there's distinct separation so a crack that basically opens up okay um, and in some places like if you live near Phoenix Arizona those are called ground fissures and they're related to uh, excessive pumping of groundwater and lowering of the water table and you can actually get cracks out in the desert that we would call a ground fissure uh, here in Iceland because these are in solid rock and because they're caused by tectonic movements um, the plates separating I think it'd be a better term to call them a tectonic fissure 
and then we have an eruptive fissure so if that if we have that same basic structure or feature but now this is actually a pathway so magma has risen along this fissure and this becomes the site of an eruption this then becomes an eruptive fissure okay and so that eruptive fissure will erupt for some period of time and this is what we saw the last three eruptions over the last three years in Iceland um, and then if we were to see this you know thousands of years from now and see it solidified we would call it a dike uh, so let's see if the, the the diagrams and the photos I put together here will help a little bit so uh, this is not too far this is near the very southwest tip of uh, Iceland near a lighthouse called Reykjanes Viti um, and this is about a half a meter wide I, I didn't put any scale in there I apologize but you can see that this basalt this rock gray rock cuts through these layered rocks this is just bits of ash um, and rock tiny rock fragments and then it directly feeds into this lava flow here so this was a conduit for magma that rose when this erupted I think this erupted like this is the Stampar uh, eruptive sequence maybe five seven hundred years ago something like that um, 800 somewhere in that range anyway and so this thing actually came up and fed this lava flow that you see up near the surface here so there's a dike but but when it was erupting if you'd been there when it was erupting you would call this an eruptive fissure so this is kind of both in that sense this was the conduit that magma rose through it was an eruptive fissure now when we go look at it all that magma solidified it's no longer erupting and because it's cutting across the rock layers there we would properly call this a dike okay um, okay here's one I got from close to where I live here in Idaho and I've got two versions of this this is an area called Kings Bowl um, it looks like a lot of chaos in there there's a rock hammer for some scale but look in the center of the photo and you might be able to see a, a pattern or a fabric where uh, the, there's layering and lines that run more or less vertically and then right about here just below the rock hammer you might see it kind of spreading out and kind of forming like a Y shape uh, and here's a little better view of that so this is another or was an eruptive fissure this is about 2,000 years old this this volcanic event um, and now this is a, a dike if you will because it's it's cutting across those rock layers so pretty fun I wanted to throw something in a little locally just to mix it in with the Iceland stuff uh, and then we have fissures we have tectonic fissures this is a photo I took at a place pretty near also again fairly near the area we're looking at this is Lama Felsia um, probably messed that one up but uh, you can see this crack in the ground where the walls have just separated so there's not magma never came through this material um, this did not erupt this is just a place where the plate movement and the stress in the rocks have separated this once continuous rock body into two discrete um, walls if you will and there's this fun little narrow slot that you can actually hike through for I don't know maybe 100 meters or so that's that's pretty neat um, same things you see at Thingvellir so there in some places near Thingvellir there's even a part of it that's under the lake there in the water uh, and people will go scuba diving and snorkeling through that that fissure that that tectonic fissure you can see this one here on land not too far away um, contrary to you know what the internet and tour sites will tell you this is not the, the actual boundary between the two plates remember that the plate boundary is more of a zone and not a discrete line uh, in many places it can be in some places but here in Iceland most places it's more of a zone that divides up those plates a little bit so um, I don't know if that was helpful at all rather than you know if I muddied the waters I apologize but rather than sticking to names if the names are confusing whatever the more important thing is that we understand the processes right that we understand what exactly uh, is going on when we look at this situation in Iceland that we understand this area is sinking that there's a magma intrusion um, that sort of thing so um, okay hopefully that helps a little bit and I want to look at quickly also um, a viewer and I can't remember the viewers name so I apologize it might have been more than one um, uh, notified me of this site which I was unaware of until today and this thing is pretty cool so what this is is map.ice and it's you know it's satellite imagery of the ground so here's Grindavik there's the road going to Reykjavik 
Uh, I think you guys know the area pretty well now. Power plant is just up here. There we go, power plant, Blue Lagoon. But what this also allows you to do, there's a fun little button over here called time travel, which sounds exciting. And when you click on that, what it does is it adds an image from the past and you can compare. So here what we're going to be comparing is what Grindavik looked like in 1954 when they actually did an aerial photograph. Technology was very different back then versus what it looks like today. And I want to show you a couple things here that are pretty, pretty striking. So if we drag this over this way, um, you can see how much smaller the town was back then. None of this, no development here. Uh, there's just a few houses here. I don't know what the population was back then, probably uh, a couple hundred at the most. Um, the harbor was a little bit different. Okay, and then I'll just maybe drag this back and forth a few times. It's a little overwhelming because your eyes just want to fixate on all the houses because um, they're contrast and, and just kind of pop. Um, but you can see like the sports center here and you know all sorts of things being built more more buildings down along the the coast but let's look at what, what geologists use these types of image images for is comparing and looking at landforms um, so if we look closely let's kind of focus around this lake we can see today there is uh, some fissures right we just learned the, the term so there's some tectonic or ground fissures running northeast southwest over here by this lake. And if we look at uh, the 1954 image, we can see they were still there. So those things predate the image. They've been around for some time. Um, but let's look at another area because there's one specific area where I think this is a really valuable exercise for us to pursue. So if we move the image up here, let's zoom out just a little bit. It's kind of it's a little squirrely with the zoom. Let's try that. <clears throat> what I want you to look at is the area right here around the sports complex and around this intersection. So let's strip it away and then let's come in a little bit. Now it's a little fuzzy. This is actually for 1954. I'd say this is a pretty good aerial photo. But notice there's a clear, it's either a little escarpment or that might be a little bit of a fissure. You can see the, the shadows there. And it's hard to say, um, you can see, but you can see the shadows from the houses that the time of day was, uh, the sun was to the southwest a little bit, casting shadows to the north, northeast. And so very likely that this is actually a little bit of a, a crack or opening that extends down into this area here. And if we roll it back to today, Notice that that coincides pretty well if you've been watching some of the other updates. This is more or less where we've seen the large crack opening up uh, right there near the main intersection in Greenavik was uh, right, right about here. And so what might have happened here, and again, just now, now let's ar armchair quarterback it. The data shows us that in 1954, we had some sort of uh, a little bit of a escarpment, a linear feature. Uh, running northeast southwest just north of what was then the small town of Grindavik and now what we have um, in today now this doesn't show it because it's not you know even though it's 2023 it's not showing it today per se um, is that same feature so the what what they probably did was they um, you know excavated moved some stuff around to level all these pads for all this all this building. I mean, there's some large buildings, a sports complex and such built in this area. Um, but that feature still remained beneath the, the, the streets and the sidewalks and the buildings. And I wonder if either the shaking um, has caused the subsidence in that area or it could be um, just settling, right? So you've got this, the point is you have this pre-existing fracture or ten or tension fissure if you want to call it that uh that was running through town there so i found that really interesting i'm probably not the first or only person that's seen that but um i thought that was maybe worthwhile pointing out and so this is a fun feature you actually can go back unfortunately they did it in 1954 um and then there's some imagery from 1957 so that shows it as well you can see it running through there but then the next available date it jumps all the way up like you know 40 years to 1996 uh, and by then you can see that um, they'd already started to build and so that feature 
that linear feature is pretty much obscured, but that's that's because of the construction that was going on there. So anyway, I found that really interesting. So appreciate uh, someone to someone that turned me on to that that map feature on the internet. Very helpful. Um, okay, so let me wrap up with some questions and kind of a big picture assessment of what's been going on. Um, so let's put this into perspective a little bit. As we, as we sit and wait and wonder what's going on, maybe getting frustrated because we're in Iceland and we've been displaced from our homes, unfortunately, and this thing just seems to be dragging on with no end in sight. And you know, the waiting and the, un, the unknown is definitely, I'm sure, the hardest part. Um, and so we're definitely feeling a lot of empathy for our good friends in Iceland. But let's look at these last three eruptions and how you might have forgotten. You probably remember when they erupted because that was the exciting part. But you maybe don't know or have forgotten the events that led up to these eruptions. And so let's remember that the first thing that happened volcanically in this entire peninsula since seven, 800 years ago or so was this 2021 eruption. But this 2021 eruption, which lasted for six months, actually began as a series of earthquakes in December of 2019. So we started to see anomalously high seismic activity in this region way back in December of 2019. That unrest continued throughout the entire 2020 year. And so right through COVID, while we're all dealing with the pandemic, um, there was magma on the move beneath this part of the Reykjanes Peninsula. Uh, and it wasn't until March of 2021 that magma broke the surface and became lava. So that's a good, uh, what, 15 or so months of everything being underground, just earthquakes and ground deformation. Everything we're seeing and experiencing now near Grindavik was happening for over a year um, prior to this eruption, just to give you some perspective. So that's maybe not what a lot of people want to hear, but the waiting game might go on a long time, as we've seen in the past. And that was my point there. In contrast, these two eruptions uh, were very different. Um, the August 2022 eruption, which I had the good fortune of, of visiting and, and witnessing firsthand, um, this thing took about a week. So earthquakes started happening, um, and within a week of the the unrest, the, the the seismic unrest that was taking place, it had erupted. Literally, you know, early August, things start stirring around, and within a week or so, there's lava on the surface, and this thing's in full eruption. And that's similar to what happened earlier this year in this area. About a week or so of earthquake swarms and seismic activity and ground deformation, and then boom, it actually erupts. So it might be that this eruption we're dealing with here is more similar to the 2021 event. Well, we kind of know it has, it, it, it probably is. Uh, and that might be, again, just sort of throwing an interpretation and seeing if it sticks. This event took some time to come to fruition because that magma had to create a path, create a conduit in an area that hadn't erupted for quite some time. Um, whereas these two eruptions probably exploited, you know, the, the, the large magma body deep underground had created most of the plumbing system and the conduits. Um, and these just were able to only only had to move a short distance or for only a week or so those earthquakes clearing out a path for that magma to make its way to the surface because we're dealing with a new region over here uh, and we don't know it possibly you know it's a different it's far enough away that it, it probably has the same magma source at depth way down there but as it comes up it might be branching um, and so it's breaking through new rocks and we saw that with all the earthquakes over the last weekend or so and now we're just waiting to see how long it's going to take that magma to get to the surface and so uh, just wanted to offer that that little perspective there for what it's worth. So, um, okay, so let me get to a few of the questions now. And the way I've done these is I just grabbed a few. Again, there's so many questions that came in from the last update that I can't get to them all, but I will try to either answer th those questions either here on an update in video form, or I will try to uh, 
reply via you know a written response to you on the on the Facebook on the comment page so so Amanda Joe who's been helping me out with a lot of this uh, she got she got top billing so some of her friends have been texting her and asking if I would explain tectonic plates and why plates move the way they do and how it all relates to volcanoes and earthquakes and I I mean that could be easily a, a two-hour lecture um, and I probably won't do it complete justice but let me let me see if I can quickly give her uh, some good information there so uh, the earth is divided up into these big things called tectonic plates big slabs of the earth's crust um, this is a very simplified map the details there's a lot more detail than is shown here there's much smaller what we call micro plates but this is a good kind of first view of the whole thing as you can see with the red arrows the plates are all moving in different directions um, some plates are moving apart like we have in Iceland other plates are colliding, like over here by Alaska or in the Western Pacific. Uh, and some plates are sliding past each other, like we see in California with the San Andreas Fault. Um, these plate boundaries are where all the action is. So this is where we see, in general, I'd say 90% of all volcanic activity, 90% of all earthquakes on the planet happen at a plate boundary. So if you want to predict the next earthquake, pick one of these black lines between these different colors uh, and there's a good chance you'll be right. Furthermore, the most um, frequent location for earthquakes and volcanoes is not so much where the plates are spreading, it's actually where the plates are colliding. And so these places here, what's what we call a convergent plate boundary, so down in New Zealand, over here into Indonesia and the Philippines and Japan and Northeast Russia and over here into Alaska, these are the places where we see not only the most frequent earthquakes, but also the largest earthquakes. So the biggest, most destructive quakes. So if you think back to, there was a big earthquake in Japan in 2011, magnitude nine, that's right on one of these boundaries. We had another one in 2004 in Indonesia that generated a huge tsunami. I think it killed like a quarter of a million people. That's right here along one of these, these types of plate boundaries, um, what we call a convergent plate boundary. Um, so, Iceland, though, is a little bit different because it's both a divergent boundary and it's a hot spot. So it's, if it was just a regular divergent boundary, well, one, it wouldn't be an island. It would be all underwater, just like the rest of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and two, it would not nearly be as active in terms of earthquakes and volcanoes. So Iceland is a bit of an anomaly because it's a hot spot. It has a lot of magma underneath it that's trying to rise. Um, and that's what's actually causing a lot of the earthquakes and volcanoes we see there. Um, hopefully, did I answer why, why why the plates move the way they do? Okay, let me get to that real quick. And again, I'm going to try to be brief with these um, so I, I can be respectful of your time. Um, why do they move the way they do? So the thing that drives plate motion, so why, what controls these arrows here? You can see that some plates have continents on them. So like the North American plate has Greenland, a little bit of Iceland. Uh, U.S., Canada, Mexico, parts of the Caribbean, even parts of Russia and a sliver of Japan. Other plates, like the Pacific Plate, have no land masses on them for the most part, except a little bit of uh, New Zealand and a little bit of California. Um, turns out that where the plates are colliding, for the most part, is th the plate motion is faster. So the, the plates that have a big area of convergence, like you can see here on the Pacific Plate, also have high rates of motion. So the Pacific plate is one of the fastest moving plates on the planet. I think it moves something like, oh boy, I got a map right here. Um, hundred, it's about 11 centimeters per year. So maybe like five to six inches per year. Um, other plates though, like in Iceland, move much slower, just about you know two centimeters per year. So some of these plates that are pushing the, the land masses or plates apart, these tend to be much more slow moving plate uh, plates in terms of motion than these places like we see over here or along the coast of South America. This is a fast moving plate as well. So, okay, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully that helps. Um, all right, from uh, at Delta Leader 227, how fast are the plates moving versus others like in California and other parts of the world? I think I kind of just answered that. Um, yeah, just a few centimeters on average per year is the plate motion rates we see around Iceland. Others move a lot faster. 
yeah, I think I covered that already. Uh, from this person, Rock to Parabin. 9372 is the spreading at a divergent plate margins punctuated or is it a steady slow creep being as they are mostly underwater has this been studied that's a great question um, so most of the plate boundaries at the divergent plate boundaries um, most plate boundaries work like this they don't do anything they just sit there the stress builds until finally the stress is greater than the rocks ability to maintain that that stress, if you will. So otherwise, uh, in other words, the the forces involved that are trying to pull the plates apart exceed the actual strength of the rock, and then the plates move apart. You get movement. You generate earthquakes. In that instance, it all happens in split second or a few seconds, and then it's over. And then the plates build more stress, build more stress over time. That being said, there are also places, especially at some divergent plate boundaries, where they do move a little bit slowly. It's what we call a seismic creep. So it's moving slowly without the sudden burst of energy that comes with, with earthquakes. Um, so that's my best understanding of that. Okay, um, next question. Uh, is it possible that high volumes of runoff water from the power plant and the Blue Lagoon, which has high silica mineral composition, can impact underground magma flow when it percolates back down through the earth and back into underground reservoirs. I would say no. So there's the water that comes out of the power plant fills the Blue Lagoon. Some of that water percolates back down. Um, but that, that water is going to stay close to the surface. Some of it might get deeper. Um, but in this case where we're dealing with this current situation, the magma body is much bigger, has a lot more heat, and really wouldn't uh, be affected by the water. That's my best take on that. Um, this person here, Valdiste123, in the scenario where there does not end up being an eruption, so if we have no eruption, at what point would that be confirmed with certainty? What type of change in the data would need to be seen before the area be could be considered safe again? Wow, that's a tricky one. Um, in some ways, that's almost, I don't say it's the worst case scenario, but it's an undesirable scenario because you're basically saying maybe the earthquakes trickle off and get smaller and smaller. Maybe they're kind of still there, magnitude ones. You're getting a few earthquakes, but basically you, you get you get to a point where everything kind of flattens out to some background level. Um, and maybe the, so that's what I would say is if the earthquakes go back to being what they were before the earthquakes or before the this sequence of uh, seismic activity, you know, like what, what we saw maybe a month ago. Um, and if the the subsidence in and around uh, Grindavik, if that stabilizes, then I would say we're back to a new normal, back to a new point where um, I don't know if I, I don't think I'd ever call this area in the short term safe again. Um, but at least we're in a stable situation. So hopefully that kind of makes some sense there. Uh, from Danielle Cody, um, wondering if subsidence could result from magma cooling and contracting as it nears the surface. Um, not really. <laughs> the magma is, the rocks are really good insulators. So even if that magma is cooling, it's cooling at such a slow rate. Like if I had you stick a thermometer in the magma, you know, a week ago, and then we come back in a month and you go to the same point and stick a thermometer in it, it's probably only lost a few degrees. And we're talking about, you know, 1500 degrees, 1600 degrees Celsius. So it's such a high number that it's, it's, it's minuscule. It's, it's, it's negligible. Um, so I don't think the subsidence that we're seeing right now is from the magma cooling and contracting. What we might be seeing is the subsidence is occurring because the magma that had filled that area underneath the town had now moved has now moved elsewhere and so it had occupied that space took up a certain amount of volume but if it migrates let's say to the northeast and occupies some other space then you've 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 lost some of the volume there and so you'd expect it to drop a little bit so um awesome and this person's also an earth science teacher excellent uh steven grentner uh, da, 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 da. You mentioned recently that the volcanism in Iceland is cyclical, and I was wondering, firstly, what might be causing that, and secondly, if this has been seen elsewhere. So he's referring to um, this, I think he's referring to this graphic I put up 
in a previous update that shows different regions on the peninsula and their um, eruptive activity over time. So the yellow bars are when they were volcanically active. Um, and then you can see these big, these big gaps in here, right? There's spells where it hasn't erupted. Um, we have to be kind of careful with this though, because really at any given system, any one of these locations, we're only dealing with about three data points, right? So it erupted here, it erupted here, it erupted here, at least in terms of its place and time. Um, you know, so there was 600 years between eruptions, 750, 780. I would be really hesitant to like take the average of that and say it's cyclical and every 720 years it erupts. That's not how these things work. Um, it is an interesting set of data because we are seeing that when one is active, others are active during a relative range of, of, of times. And when one is not active, none of the others are active as well. That could be related to how the maybe the magma and the hotspot works its way into this area. Um, I don't know. Like, I have no clue why it would do that. Um, but volcanoes are seldom cyclic and we would want to see much further back. I'd want to see back if we could get data back, you know, 10 times as far as this, then we might be able to make some rough calculations and estimates. But three data points is pretty, is not much. And so you'd hate to, you'd hate to base, that's what we call a recurrence interval when you have, um, you know, so you'd say like, for example, with this one here, if these three numbers, 780, 750, and 600 average out to let's say 720 that would be the the recurrence interval that would be the interval in which you see uh, eruptive events so uh, hopefully i helped with that one uh mayo man let's see how do they pinpoint the epicenters of each earthquake also can you do a deeper dive into the data contained in the pop-up where the beach ball graph resides oh boy um so we pinpoint earthquake epicenters by looking at, I didn't pull up any graphics for this, so I apologize. I didn't know how far into the questions I'd get, but at this point, I think I'm gonna to try to get through uh, the last four or five I know that are on here. Basically, we look at, if you think of a seismogram with the up and down little lines there, there's uh, P waves and S waves. And by looking at the time difference between when the first seismic wave comes in, which is called the P wave, and the second wave that comes in, which is called the S waves, by looking at that time interval, um, you can turn that into a distance because the P waves and S waves travel at uh, very calculatable speeds. We know what their speeds are through different rock types. And so you can look and see how long it takes. So that would give you, so let's say, you know, you have one point and you know that the earthquake was 100 kilometers from you. So you would draw a circle around that location. And then if you did it at another location, you'd end up with two circles that overlap. And then if you do it a third one, they would um, intersect. And so it's called triangulation. And not only is it telling you the epicenter, the location at the surface, but it's also telling you, if you think about them not being circles, think about them being spheres, three-dimensional spheres. Those th three spheres are, are intersecting in three-dimensional space in the ground. So it also tells us the depth. So not just the location at the surface, which is the epicenter, but the location underground. So it tells us the depth. Um, I'll have to wait on the deeper dive on the beach ball thing, sorry. Um, David RP6KS, as more time elapses, will it change the nature of the eruption? Will it be more violent or last longer? I don't think so. I think uh, whether it erupts in a week or four months, I think the eruptive style and the eruptive behavior will largely be the same. It depends a little bit on how much dissolved gas is in the magma, uh, but this is a system we know we can look all around the peninsula and all we see is basaltic lava flows. Sometimes it's fissure eruptions, sometimes it's cinder cones or shield volcanoes, but they're all producing the same type of material. They're all largely non-violent. They're more passive or what we call effusive eruptions. So Oh, and this person thinks my Icelandic pronunciations are fantastic. I think if you're not a native speaker, it sounds pretty good. But if you speak Icelandic, you know, you know that I'm not doing it justice. So, um, okay, I think we've got just a couple more. So if you're still with me, great. Uh, with respect to building the wall around the power plant, is there any chance do you think that there may be some sinkage of the power plant or further sinking of the homes? Thus, the risk is not just from the lava flow, but also from subsidence. Or is the risk of more earth cracking... Yeah, um, 
the risk of more earth cracking displacement has not passed it's still going on um and the fear is now more about protecting i think the reason they built the wall even though maybe uh, at the point even though the eruption may not be anywhere near the power plant i think it's a good idea just to do it because you're seeing an area that's becoming more volcanically active uh since 2021 and looking forward you're likely to see eruptions in this area the power plant's incredibly important it supplies the whole peninsula and the airport with uh, power and hot water. Um, so protecting that is like a high priority in Iceland. And so why not build it now? Because you might need it for protection for this event. And if you don't need it as protection from this event, you might need it uh, down the line with a future event. So uh, SJ Lewis, um, as the intrusion lengthens, is the force of the possible eruption lessened? Um, not really. Um, the intru intrusion lengthens. I see what you're saying. Like, is it because it's being supplied by more from underneath? So there's still. I think the Icelandic Met Office, if we got back and looked at some of those updates, they still have data suggesting that magma influx into the system is still occurring. So if it lengthened, um, more magma is rising into it, and so that that continues to keep the eruption risk pretty high. Uh, Dan Matthews, you mentioned the formations of rock that were formed from glacier, volcanic eruptions under glaciers in the last ice age. Could you more explain that, please? Um, yeah, and I've been to Snowdonia and Wells. That's a cool place, too. Um, you know, I'll probably answer that, Dan, with a, and I think it's my last one here. Yep. Um, I have a couple cool videos. Basically, in a nutshell, when eruptions like this in Iceland occur under ice, um, if there's enough ice on top of it, which is a bit variable, but let's say you've got, you know, several hundred meters of ice sitting on top of your, your volcanic vent, um, that ice pressure will keep it in check, much like the ocean keeps a lot of eruptions in check for a while. And so the initial thing we get are these things called pillow lavas, these kind of blob looking cool structures. Uh, so it's lava that's erupting, it's cooling very quickly, it's, in, it's melting some of the ice. So you can imagine the volcano does melt some ice, but the amount of ice compared to magma or lava initially uh, is, much, is it's skewed towards the ice. Um, but as it melts more and more ice, we get a big pile of pillow lava. And as that ice above it, the ice is going to actually sink and collapse a little bit. And then as the eruption continues, uh, at some point you have so little ice on top of it, or maybe even like a, a glacial lake sitting on top of the volcanic vent, that you get to a point where the volcanic gases and the water, it can now flash to steam. And so it becomes explosive. And so then it becomes explosive. It fragments the lava. It produces ash. It pr throws out blocks of lava and rock uh, that build up. That usually forms a, a rock type um, called hyaloclastite. Um, and then eventually the lava is coming up through all the material it has erupted. The ice is now elsewhere, not in this location. And then it can just flow out regular, normal lava on top and form like a little cap of, of basaltic lava. And I explain this in one of my videos. If you go to some of my Iceland videos, I show you some evidence for that. They're called tuyas. Um, and it might be something about ice under or volcanoes under ice or something like that. So um, if you stuck with me for this long one, that's awesome. Uh, if you bowed out early, that's okay too. Um, hopefully this was helpful. I'll try to get some to some more questions. Uh, if this is a good format for addressing questions, if that's helpful for everyone, let me know. If you'd prefer that I just answer the questions to the people on the comments, let me know as well. But also please realize that some of these videos have literally hundreds and hundreds of comments. Um, and I'm a one-man show here. And so I'll get, I, I'll get to them if I can. Some of them might be very short answers because uh, I just don't have the time to fully address it. So, uh, But I will try to be as proactive as I can with that sort of thing. So until next time, thanks so much. Um, we'll get to some more questions. We'll see what tomorrow brings. For all of you in Iceland, stay well, stay safe. Um, yeah, just, just take a deep breath and just roll with the punches as I know you will. So we're, we're thinking about you and that's about all. So have a good one. Thanks for your time.